Hello and welcome to Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. I am your host, Raya Salter. I'm an energy attorney, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. I'm also the principal attorney of Imagine Power LLC. So today we're going to get to know one of the real go-getters in our state government. I am talking about Representative Andrea P.L. Tupola. She is a Republican and represents House District 43 and is on the Finance, Health, and Human Services Committees. She is also on the Nanakuli, Makakilo, and Kapolei Neighborhood Boards. Andrea is a passionate advocate for her district and has a very interesting background. We are so glad that she is here so we can learn more about her. Thank you and welcome. Andrea. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You are so welcome. So um, just really excited that you're here. I'm glad to have the opportunity to talk to you. And I really thought it would just be a good opportunity to introduce the Think Tech audience to you and learn a little bit about your background. You've got a really interesting one, your sort of path to politics and I'm sure many, many other things. So if it's all right, I figured I'd just dig in and start asking you a few questions. Sure, go ahead. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Um, Where did you grow up? What were some of your biggest influences? Is, was there anyone in particular that you looked up to? Well, I was born in Kahuku, here on the island of Oahu. I was raised in Hawaii Kai. I attended Kamehameha schools. I was a song contest director, and I graduated with honors, um, upon which I got accepted into Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. I was able to attend college in Utah for four years. I served as the Polynesian Club president and the student body vice president my junior year. And then I did a mission for my church in Venezuela. So I lived out of the country for over a year. I speak Spanish, but I also was introduced to different types of governments, philosophies. As many people know in Venezuela, they practice politics a little different than other places. <laughs> Actually, that is very true and fascinating. Let's. Let's go ahead and you talked a lot about span some time. Let's. I'd like to ask you a few more questions sure. about some of those things. So, um, I know that you said you were involved in performing arts at Kamehameha. You were an art, art uh, honor student. Um, talk a little bit about that experience and how it helped shape your life. Um, well, as a freshman, I was a new student at Kamehameha. I went to public school from kindergarten through eighth grade. So I was one of the very few people accepted into Kamehameha mm, for ninth grade. Just as you going know, in to, to the high it's, school. It's really competitive. So where I lived in Hawaii Kai, they only let in, I think, three new people that year for ninth grade. I got early acceptance. Um, I had very high um, math and English scores. And so I got to see the campus. Before school started, it was interesting. I had never gone to Gosh, private school. It must be very, um, it must be very kind of high stakes for, or, or maybe not for a child when you sort of, I guess everyone must have heard of like the legend of the, you know, of the schools and, you know, if you're smart, you can go there. So that's a lot of pressure for a, a 12 year old, a, in a yeah. seventh and eighth grader who's like hoping to do this thing. Um, and I guess you you have to wait to see if you're accepted. Yeah, it was. I think it was a new experience for me since I'd never gone to private school. But I think, moreover, it was such a big school to go into from mm. going from a very small middle school into a very huge high school. Our graduating class had over 400 students. So it was interesting because I was able to do more than what I had done before. So my freshman year I did, I designed our class t-shirt, you know, I tried out for a song <laughs> contest, I played basketball, and there's so much opportunity out right. there. And so I tried to take advantage of everything. I was in band my freshman year, sophomore year I joined choir, I was the song contest director for our sophomore women. Um, and so I, I think for me Kamehameha was one of those growing moments where you get to see whether you sink or swim in a bigger pond of very competitive, talented little fish and <laughs> see where you, you know, stand in comparison to everybody else. So uh, I, it sounds like, I know that music is a big part of your life and it sounds like uh, Kamehameha, that was one of the things that you dug into. What What is your sort of main interest in the area of music? I know you're a music teacher, and I'm gonna ask you more about it later. But. I, at the age of four, started playing piano. At the age of 10, played flute, and then I always had private lessons in voice, piano, and um, in flute. My mother is a, a music teacher, so naturally for me, when there was an opportunity to try out for a song contest director, I wanted to do it. Okay, what is a song contest director? Oh, so at Kamehameha School, 
<laughs> we have this big tradition where every year each grade level competes singing ah. koin songs. So you can, ah. you have the women's songs, you have the men's, and then we do one co-ed piece. So every year when you compete, you can win awards for Olala Hawaii. So whoever spoke um, Hawaiian, I guess, judged by the judges as most correct. Um, you can have a co-ed, a women's, a men's, or a um, overall winner. And so it's one of those things that come in my that you look forward to doing your whole life. I mean, it's on, people watch it across the nation because they put it on, on public television. Got it. So it's me not knowing about the, about the song <laughs> contest. That's okay. So that sounds like it was a big deal then to come in and sort of direct what's going on with, with this big contest. A well, lot I of responsibility for It's one kids. thing to be a leader. It's another thing to try to lead your peers. <laughs> Because it's people who are the same age as you that may or may not respect what you do or think that you know what you're talking about. So it was one of those opportunities that I got to step up and lead people in, that were of my age group and also try to showcase that I understand music, that I have this background, I play piano, I sing. And so it was uh, one of the unforgettable experiences of me being a Kamehameha graduate. Well, fantastic. I'm starting to hear that theme of leadership and also the arts. So I know that you went to uh, school in Utah on scholarship, and you were very active in the student body and the Polynesian student body. Tell us about that, and was this really where your, perhaps your love of politics or organizing started to, to sort of become reality? Uh, maybe, you know, as a freshman, I was um, the president of a women's organization as a sophomore. I was the president of the Polynesian organization as a junior. I ran into a few people that wanted me to run for the overall student body government that we had at the school. We have 33,000 students at B BYU. Oh, gosh. Uh, it's a very big university that's um, married students. Uh, single students, online students, so there's a diverse crowd of people at BYU. So I was approached by one of the people interested in running for president, and he basically sent somebody to come talk to me, and they asked me to run with him because we run as partners. So president and vice president run on the same Got ticket it, together. Got it, as a ticket together. So they approached me, and they said, you know, we've been looking at your bio, and you're one of the most powerful people at BYU. And I had to laugh because I was like, how do you know that? <laughs> like, we're right, just, I see you coming for my ego, politician. Like, we're just students. <laughs> who has time to pull the student body and ask who, you know? So long story short, I, I wasn't adverse to the idea, but I don't think I really was interested in it until I met um, the guy that I ran with. His name was Matt Black, um, Matt Blackburn. And so basically, he he basically introduced me to what it would be to lead. And long story short, it was 10 different teams running against us. We were able to come wow. up on top. It was very, very competitive. If you know anything about Utah, everybody there is like amazingly talented. <laughs> so we were like running against like the governor's son, the right. senator's son. And like these guys. It's that school too, because yeah. all everyone goes there because it's the. It's like the best of the best. So when we're running against, you know, Stephen Covey's son and all these other, you know, famous people's kids, I'm like, who are we to run against these people? And they've got all these expectations too, I'm sure. Like, oh, and I'm sure they have political connections right. and I don't know what. But we had a very strong team. I would say the team that I ran with as well as uh, the team we won with, some of those guys are actually still in politics. One of them works at the White House. My other, um, <laughs> Isn't that VP, amazing? Yeah, my other VP is a uh, Supreme Court Justice in California. Oh, one wow. of the, so a lot of us that were interested in doing this, it wasn't just like a fly-by-night idea. We all had um, leadership Real kind of in us. Political, or not political ambition necessarily, but we're sort of... Yeah, had leadership, that's what you said, leadership yeah. within you. Yeah, so it was, I think it was a really interesting experience to interact with the Utah government. I, I spoke with the governor of Utah as well as we interacted with other student governments across the Utah front. So other colleges met with them, saw how we could network together. So it was my first introduction to how to campaign. And bear in mind, I did it in the snow. So knocking <laughs> doors in the snow, campaigning when you had to wear a cold, you know, a thick jacket so that you didn't freeze to death. And those two weeks of campaign is what led us into a year of serving the student body at BYU. You know, that's it's interesting because I went to a very small college, but for a school of sort of the prestige and size of BYU, uh, student president, vice president, I think, are actually extremely important. Not that it wasn't important at Wesleyan where I went, but I mean, it really wasn't. They were like figuring out, you know, what the student groups were going to do, et cetera. I mean, it was important, but you've got 
30,000 constituents, that's a lot. Yeah, and I think because there's such a high level of leadership in Utah, mm. you know, we, that's the first time I embraced the Stephen Covey training. I read through the, um, the Colors Code that does personality traits. So it was my first introduction to how do you manage a group of students? And I'm talking about, I have eight people under me, I have 50 people under that, and then I have 33,000 people under that. So how do you manage in such a way that everyone stays inspired? Because some of our hardest workers were volunteers. No mm -hmm. scholarship. Of course. Just wanted to come out, help the student body. So how do you make the volunteer then the champion of this cause? It's the exact same thing we do in politics. Our best, most, you know, active community participants, volunteers. Right. That's exactly right. And I'm going to ask you more about your district and your constituents later. But before we get there, tell us about this service year. And you're right. The, uh, well, I guess, was that the Chavez era oh, when you yes. were there? Tell us a bit about the service year and what it was like to live so there So I love regime. telling this experience because so many people that haven't ever lived out of the country have no idea mm. what it feels like. You know, upon entering the country, I landed in Caracas, and they had some people pick us up at the airport. I distinctly remember driving through a huge freeway, four lanes or five lanes across, but there were seven lanes of cars, which I was confused why we don't follow the lines, but according to the people in Venezuela, that's just a suggestion. <laughs> don't necessarily need to stay in the lines. <laughs> just a suggestion. And, and then, you know, people are running across the freeway with kids holding hands, fruit or, you know, food on their head. And I was like, what kind of chaos is this? We get into Valencia, which is the first area that I lived in. And same thing, there was a stoplight, it was red, the guy driving our car just honked his way straight through the stoplight. I was like, hey, are we gonna stop? He said, you don't need to stop, you can just keep going. It's us against traffic. Oh yeah, it was crazy. So I remember my first you know, impression of Venezuela was like, hey, is there any organization here? Because uh, everyone you know, can carry guns and different people from the government do search your car when you mm. pass through certain checks and they're searching it with guns as they're searching through your bag. And I was taken aback because you know, we don't have that type of right. procedure here in the United States right. and in Thankfully. every city that I lived in I mean they had a very strong hostility towards Americans mm. they were confused about Hawaii though they didn't really know if yeah, Hawaii sure. was part of the US <laughs> you know because I look kind of Latina a lot of people would ask me like hey what country are you from I said oh, I'm, from Hawaii. I'm from Hawaii where is that is that by Jamaica I was like it's in the <sighs> it's in the ocean yeah so it was I think for me an eye-opener to think what do other people perceive us mm -hmm, as you know mm -hmm. and the constant comment that came back to us was because of America we are the way we are because they're so selfish they don't share they don't this then this is why we have this country the way it is so I took a step back kind of thought who, who taught you that well right. the government gives them free education free housing free medical so a lot of their mindset the way they look and think about things is because the government taught them so and this and so when you're, part in, of it. when you're giving the lowest you know, economic class everything free, I mean, Chavez stayed in power for a very long time before he passed away. And so, and you can look it up. This is not like secret knowledge. It is very public knowledge that, you know, the party that they supported was socialism. So. Oh, no, no. I, yeah, it's, and it's tragic what's been happening recently there where everything has fallen apart. When people ask me, like, you know, is that for real? Absolutely. Yeah, it's I real. absolutely lived through that. Like watching protests break out in the middle of the street. I lived in areas where there wouldn't be water for a week. We'd have to save it in, in trash bins. That's what we use to clean, you know, the toilet, mm -hmm. to wash our clothes, to brush our teeth. I mean, mm -hmm. that type of lifestyle is something that some people here would never understand. That's right. And seeing families live in small little squares, 14, 16 people in one little room with one little burner to make their food. I mean, those are the kind of things I've never seen in my life before. And I... I lived amongst these people and I had to learn about them because I was a teacher there, you know, I mm -hmm. taught them and I served the people in Venezuela, but moreover, it opened up my mind to what can a government really do and how does a government influence the way people think and feel about themselves? Well, that's actually a great place to take a pause. Um, we are going to take a break and we will be back on Power Up Hawaii with Representative Andrea Tafola. Living in this crazy world so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solution, how to make a brighter day. What do we do? We've got to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better. Try a little more, harder than before. 
You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, 25 talk shows by 25 dedicated hosts every week, helping us to explore and understand the issues and events in and affecting our state. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king come banging on your chest, you can beat the world, you can beat the war, you can talk to God, go banging on his door, you can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock, you can move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master, don't wait for luck, dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Hi, and welcome back to Power Up Hawaii, uh, where Hawaii comes together to talk about a clean, renewable, and just energy future. Today, we are getting to know Representative Andrea Topola. Welcome. It has just been a treat to have you here. Thank We've you. talked a bit about Andrea's background, um, and you were telling us about your service project in Venezuela after college and how it really just gave you some insights into sort of how, into civic life and, and how places operate differently. Um, so I'd like to bring that back, that, that biography back a little bit. So I guess you came back from Venezuela. And at some point, um, you met your husband and made your way back to Hawaii. Tell us what happened there. So I lived in LA. Um, my mom is from Pasadena. And I taught school in a place called El Arca. So I taught um, disabled Hispanic adults. So when I was in LA, I, I met my husband in Rancho Cucamonga when he was visiting family. And at that time, I had already signed a contract to teach in Arizona. So I taught high school. In Casa Grande in the southern part of Arizona, a little bit above Tucson. And at that time, my husband was in his junior year ah. playing at the University of Utah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so he played under Urban Meyer. He was one of the first teams to break into the BCS, which was a big deal back then. Please, what is the BCS? Sorry. So uh, <laughs> the Bowl Champion Series is basically uh, the colleges that make it far far enough to play in like the Rose the bowl, bowl. games. The got, it, got, it, got, bowl, it, got 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 it. So the BCS has a, a bunch of teams that can play, but University of Utah was the first ones to come in under Urban Meyer, who has a record um, of taking college teams up to the national championship. So he was very lucky to play under him and he was a four-year starter he was a team captain his last year so his junior year is when we were dating and I kind of flew over to Utah to see his games we got married um, in February of 2006 and I went back to Arizona he went back to Utah because I had to finish off my teaching so it was a just teacher. a coincidence that he was in Utah you had come from Utah and you met in California yeah okay especially <laughs> because he's actually from Kahuku which is where I was born yeah so. that's and we're was something 17 that was meant days to be. apart, so we actually are the same exact age. But we hadn't met growing up. Um, but uh, upon you know getting married, I decided to finish out my teaching career in Arizona. And then later, we moved in together. And then his senior year, I supported him through his last season. And he got a free agent deal to play in Texas. So spent some time there. I went to Michigan. In the meantime, I had uh, children. So I decided to come back to Hawaii when he finished his football career. Then we moved home in 2008 um, when he entered uh, Honolulu Police Department. Oh, got it. Fantastic. So I know that here you're a music teacher in addition to the work you do in politics. Um, is it still, I know you talked about piano and voice. So what, do you, what is it that you teach? So um, in 2007, I entered into the master's program at University of Hawaii. I graduated in 2011, and I um, got my first job teaching at Leeward Community College. I, teach, uh, I taught voice and choir. So I love choir, I love singing, and so those are the first classes I taught. So I taught for about three and a half years before I ended up getting elected into office. Okay, and I want to talk. I want to hear uh, talk more about your district. But before we do that, I know you're now getting your PhD oh, at yeah. UH. So what is it that you're focusing on on your doctorate? So all three of my degrees are in music education. So upon uh, completing my master's degree, I immediately entered into the doctoral program, and I'm studying uh, tone deafness. So I'm oh how interesting. Yeah, I'm studying with a professor from Japan. His name is Toru Yuba, and I just came from Japan. Uh, oh. This past year, I went and studied with him at Mie University. And so what he has done is come up with a theory that helps people to improve their pitch instantaneously. So oh. this is not five months, six months. This is, you go from happy birthday to Ooh. happy oh. birthday to you. <laughs> and I've seen him do it live where he just immediately is able to stretch the cricothyroid muscle, which is one that you know basically lets you uh, get high and low pitches. So there's only two muscles that are working inside the vocal mechanism. And the one muscle that he believes doesn't get stretched enough is the cricothyroid. 
Wow, so that's amazing. So you're studying how you could actually turn someone like me from a non-singer into a singer. So that's really exciting. I believe all people can learn how to sing. All right, I'm going to take that. I'm going to take that as inspiration. How about yes. that? So please go ahead now. Tell us a bit about your district. Tell so, us about the district and the folks that you represent. Um, in 2014, I had run for my very first time for the State House of Representatives. I was on the neighborhood board. and. Um, it was interesting because I had never run a campaign. However, I had a lot of people who helped to mentor me. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm, asking mm -hmm. different questions, I was able to raise sufficient amount of money to kind of get my name out there. I live in an area that I did not grow up in. I moved there in 2010. And so it was a, a huge feat for me to overcome to try to get you know, a group of people to trust me when I right, didn't grow right. up in that community. So I had to do a lot of door knocking. I had to do a lot of community outreach. I had to do a lot of showing who I was and why. What was my intent in running for office? You know, as the background of having a music teacher, people question whether or not I, I knew politics. But when I answered to them why, why I'm running to serve my community and to help them, it really helped ease a lot of people because a lot of people distrust politics because they don't know if people have the true intent to help and serve. Yeah, I think that's right. What are, t where exactly is your district? What does it cover? Um, I have starting in Maili and it goes all the way to Eva. So I have the Maili, Nanakuli, Ko'olina, Honokai Hale, Campbell Industrial, Kalailoa, and then a small pocket of Eva. That's a really um, diverse diverse area. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a bit about your district and about some of those inspiring people who, you know, the volunteers and others who yeah. are also working with you in the community. I love my district. I've learned so much from becoming a representative, from working with nonprofits to churches to schools to um, sports teams. I love um, doing community service projects. Uh, we've done nine cleanups on a very uh, heavily illegally dumped area mm. in the Waianae area. It's called Pa'akea Road. Mm. You know, I started organizing those because I really wanted to start to empower the community to take ownership over these parts of our community that needed help. Recently, I've been a lot um, doing a lot to try to solve the abandoned car issue, mm. which seems to be growing all over the island of Oahu mm. because the lots are full. So you see more and more abandoned cars that, you know, what your community looks like is basically what you feel like. And I want our community to look and reflect what awesome, wonderful people we have living there. But a lot of times it's studying a system of exactly finding a solution. Exactly. So it's not a one-time thing. It's what kind of system can you build so that this can become an ongoing solution, whether it's to cleaning streets, transforming it into a bike path, whether it's to cleaning up abandoned cars, you know, transforming it into an area where people know that this is a school zone. Or mm -hmm. So a lot of what I do is trying to look at something and determine, okay, if there's a need, how do I address that need? How do I find people that are passionate about that where we can go at it, you know, every month, every year? Because some of these solutions, they're not going to be implemented once and then just, it's gone. We need a lot of commitment from community members to have these as ongoing projects within the community. Why don't you, you, you just spoke about one issue, the car issue. Could you maybe tell us about another, well, I was going to ask, what do you think is some of the biggest challenges that are facing your district? And that's a tough question, I realize, because you've got a very diverse constituency. But what would you say is the big Top challenge? Top three, traffic, uh -huh. homelessness, mm. education. So with traffic, um, in 2014, I started a Facebook group called the West Side Traffic Alert. You know, I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. You create a Facebook group, everyone starts interacting about how to solve traffic. Well, there's close to 17,000 members in that group oh, now. Oh, wow, fantastic. And reporters use that group. Danielle Tucker just reported out of our group this morning. So TC, Danielle Tucker, all these local uh, radio traffic reporters, they look in the site because we don't have traffic cameras. So how else are they going to know else? Yeah, what, what's going on on the west side? It's been one of the most, I, I think, accurate news sources of the west side because everybody is a reporter. You can jump on there and say, I just saw an accident, right lane blocked, westbound, heading it into Nanakuli Ave, and then all of a sudden everyone knows, okay, go around this area. That's pretty accurate um, sort of uh, what do they call that? Crowd reporting or, you know, because, yeah, it's in everyone's interest to get up there and try and share that information. Right. So that one's been going great. Um, I have hosted other town halls regarding traffic and trying to improve Kole Kole so that we can get it repaired. It is a military road that mm. takes people from Waianae into Schofield. Mm -hmm. And so because there is no other access um, aside from Farrington, I've really been working hard on trying to get the military to actively upkeep that road. 
with homelessness. I've done a lot of outreach with DHS, but also with a lot of the local churches. This year I participated mm -hmm. in the point in time homeless count. Mm -hmm. So I was able to rally volunteers for a four day project where you actually go out regularly, you do surveys and you ask people regarding how long they've been homeless, what areas they're in. Talk to people and yeah, find and out what's going on. Yeah, this point in time homeless count is what gives us our federal funding. So that's extremely important to make sure that, well, obviously we all want to stand up and be counted, but it's extremely important to get an accurate count of who's there so that you can get the resources to help them. It's, it's one of the biggest critiques people give the state of Hawaii is if you don't have a baseline, then how do you set goals? So if you don't know what the local food production is, how can you say you're going to double it? If you don't know what the baseline of homelessness is, how, how are you going to say you're going to improve it? So it's one of those things that it's not just about counting, it's about, okay, now that we found people that want to come out and count, that means we found people who are passionate about this cause. So what is the solution then for Y and I, and how is it different than Wahiwa? How is it different than Kaka'ako? Because every community would handle this in a different way. You know, I think that's exactly right. On the state level, what are some of the biggest challenges that you think uh, the state faces right now? Well, economically, nobody can deny that the cost of living in Hawaii is ridiculous. I mean, yeah. I don't know anybody that doesn't yeah, have it I don't know every single day when you buy milk and you're like, really? When you put in your gas, when you do, you know, look for buying a house, when you pay rent. Absolutely. So quality I've given of, up on milk. Yeah. <laughs> I actually have guests Soy that come milk, into, come into my milk. house and they're guilty drinking the milk because they know yeah, how much it costs. Pouring oh, no, a little no. bit. Can I just have a little of my coffee? <laughs> I don't want any milk. I know how much it costs. You. I'm like, no, it's okay, we can share. <laughs> but um, I bring that up because people constantly asking, you know, with the cost of living in Hawaii, why is the legislature constantly raising taxes? Mm. And then when you sit on the legislative side, you think, oh, okay, well, this is their revenue stream. Mm -hmm. But is there a way forward where we can actually cut spending and cut taxes? You know, I just came from a tax reform conference in Utah with the top economists in the nation, and some of the practices that have been helping states across the nation is something we need to start looking at. Well, I would say I think that um, more perspectives on um, best practices and techniques that could help address those problems are definitely an excellent idea. We've got just about a minute left. Maybe you could um, close by... Uh, I don't know, perhaps just telling us if there's anything in particular going on you want to let people know about, or is there anything in particular that's happening? Why don't you just go ahead and share? Sure. Um, so we regularly have town halls. We have one next week, Tuesday. It's going to be about marijuana dispensaries. We're going to be hosting the licensees as well as the Department of Health. We have the Emergency Preparedness Fair coming up in September, and we also ho are hosting a sex trafficking conference in the second week of September. We do a lot of stuff for the community. If you want to join us, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or you can call my office, 586. Well, there you have it. Thank you so much, Andrea. Just a beautiful, young, dynamic presence in the state. Can't wait to keep track of what's going on and um, to have you back soon to talk about more issues. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and aloha. See you next week.